Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. We're uh, fortunate to have the governor here. We're fortunate to have a very good governor for our very good state. To have our former governor here also, Judge Griffith. Uh, thank you also, President Worthen, and your dear wife for being here. And uh, uh, I see many other wonderful friends, and I appreciate the chance to be with you today. I, uh, I appreciate the honor of being asked to speak at my alma mater, um, especially after such a uh, big week. It's a great week to be a cougar, all right? Um, the, uh, the school looks different uh, than uh, when I was in school here. Uh, I know I look different as well. Uh, I haven't minded getting older, uh, but my body isn't taking it very well. Um, Sometimes I long for those simpler days when bread was good for you and we hadn't heard of kale yet. Um, today, uh, we address the Constitution. Uh, truthfully, I didn't give much thought to the Constitution when I was here. Uh, and even in law school, I thought my constitutional law class was just one more subject to pass. Studying history more thoroughly, however, and reading the works of the founders and traveling to dozens of other countries, has changed that. Our Constitution was a far more dramatic departure from history than I had appreciated. From the beginning of humanity, history was characterized by some strong man assembling muscle from collaborators that would then dominate rule and generally oppress others. They were the feudal lord, the czar, Caesar, pharaoh, warlord, chief, emperor, king, all authoritarians, most of them tyrants. I have a chart in my office that traces the military and economic might of civilizations from 2000 BC until today. And over 4,000 years of human history, dominating civilizations have come and gone. The Egyptians, Greeks, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Mongolians, Romans, Chinese, and even the, the British. Only a few short-lived sparks of democracy intrude on a virtually uninterrupted flow of authoritarian domination. Now, why am I telling you this? Because authoritarianism is the default setting of human history. And knowing history as they did, some of our founders may have wondered whether to include some form or some aspects of authoritarianism in our governmental structure in order to improve the likelihood that the nation would survive. After all, America's geographic isolation and the potential to someday build a robust military could have made that a credible option. But the founders wanted something more than just national survival. They wanted the people of America to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They believed earnestly that God had endowed every person with an unalienable rights. They believed that all persons were created equal in the sight of God. Throughout history, autocracies, on the other hand, had oppressed people and had denied people these fundamental rights. So the founders worked assiduously to escape the perilous attraction of authoritarianism. But authoritarianism, as you probably know, was not the only peril they feared. They also feared what I'll call pure democracy. James Madison described such pure or unfettered democracies as, quote, spectacles, spectacles of turbulence and contention, incompatible with personal security, of the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they've been violent in their deaths. I think John Adams expressed it best. He said this, quote, remember, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes and exhausts and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. It's John Adams. It is in vain to say that democracy is less vain, less proud, less selfish, less ambitious, or less avaricious than aristocracy or monarchy. It's not true, and nowhere appears in history. Those passions are the same in all men, and when unchecked, produce the same effects of fraud, violence, and cruelty. Individuals have conquered themselves. Nations and large bodies of men never. 
So the founder's task and brilliance was crafting a system of government that would thread the needle between the two perils that had doomed every human civilization for 4,000 years, autocracy on one side and pure runaway democracy on the other. And this they accomplished in ways in which we're all familiar, three separate but equal branches of government, an electoral college to elect the president, two senators from each state, regardless of state population, lifetime appointments for members of the judiciary, the primacy of certain state powers, except for specific narrowly enumerated federal powers. Now, I acknowledge that some of the constitutional provisions to safeguard against pure democracy have eroded since the founding, but most do in fact endure. What the founders crafted, therefore, was not just elegant in design, it was a radical departure from history. Note the uncertainty for the nation's future, which was expressed by Benjamin Franklin in response to a purported question. He said he had created, or they had created a republic if you can keep it. And that concern was shared by his colleagues and countrymen. A nation by, for, and of the people had never long survived. It's important to note that the founders did not craft a final perfect union. They instead said they crafted a way for the American people to build a more perfect union. And so institutions and norms were in fact built over the ensuing decades. The sin of slavery was eventually eradicated. The first president voluntarily transferred power to his successor. The Supreme Court established the power of judicial review. The departments of the executive branch were created. Rules and procedures were adopted by each of the three branches of government. And, and through our Constitution and the institutions and norms that followed, the nation has avoided these two shoals, the shoal of authoritarianism and that of pure democracy that the founders feared. We have threaded the needle, if you will. Now, during my adolescence, uh, the world was divided between two competing systems, as you know, Russian-led authoritarianism and American-led liberal democracy. And true to historic precedent, the authoritarian competitor sought to conquer its competition through the use of force rather than through persuasion. Growing up, as Ann and I did in the 50s and 60s, we experienced a shadow of fear. We actually did have those infamous drills in school where you got under your desk for protection from possible Soviet bomb blasts. In, in my science class, we had a scale model of the Soviet satellite, Sputnik. It hung on the ceiling above our heads, reminding us that the Russians would be able to watch and attack us from, from space. And there was a little uh, ditty we used to sing. Button up your overcoat, put your goggles on, close your eyes when you realize it's an atom bomb. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I tried to convince my dad to, to build a, a bomb shelter in our backyard. We actually scoped it out together one afternoon, but in the end, he, he demurred. Many of you can't conceive of the relief, the lifting of that oppressing cloud was when the Soviet Union fell. History was over. Liberal democracy had won. Russia was going to emulate the West. China began to open up its economy. We even began to dismantle parts of our own military. Unfortunately, history has reasserted itself with vengeance. And I say with vengeance for two reasons. First, because the authoritarians of today are a good deal stronger relative to us than was the Soviet Union of the last century. And second, because America's resolve to hew to the constitutional bulwarks against authoritarianism on the one side and pure democracy on the other is less certain. Now, I'm, I'm sure you recognize, as I do, that, that authoritarianism is in its ascendancy in the world. Uh, Freedom House reports that liberal democracies have been in a, a decade-long decline. This is quite a reversal from what I'd expected. Not many years ago, uh, we thought that China would ultimately become democratic as it adopted capitalism and joined the G20. We cheered as Russia held elections. Then the only poster boys, uh, boys for authoritarianism were the little chubby guy with the bad haircut in North Korea and the uh, septuagenarian revolutionary in Cuba. Today, China 
censors its media, shreds its promise of self-rule for the people of Hong Kong, oppresses minorities, and even people of faith. Chinese leaders, did you know, insist that crosses be removed from churches in China and be replaced with the Chinese flag. The national anthem of China is sung at all church services. Church officials have to be approved by the government. And the only legal Bible that can be purchased in China is one that has been rewritten by the government. China is carrying out genocide against its largest minority. Nearly one million Uyghurs have been imprisoned in concentration camps, complete with brainwashing and forced labor. Children are separated from parents. And when the fathers are taken, Han Chinese men are sent into the home to monitor their wives. Sexual assault and forced sterilizations are common. What the Chinese Communist Party is perpetrating against the Uyghur people is atrocity not seen or imagined coming from a nation in our era. Russia's Putin actually murders his political appoint, uh, opponents. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny was, after an excess, unsuccessful assassination attempt, as you know, was subjected to a sham trial and subsequently jailed. The senators Boris Nemstov and Sergei Magnitsky were both assassinated. Venezuela's Maduro brutalizes the citizens that have not already fled. Assad has killed hundreds of thousands of his citizens in Syria. And sadly, the Taliban flag flies above the presidential palace in Afghanistan. What's even more surprising than the appalling brutality of the authoritarian regimes is their relative economic and military strength. Russia's expanded and modernized its nuclear arsenal at great cost. Today, it's not only larger than ours, it's more advanced. China's Navy is larger than ours and has been specifically designed to defeat ours. Its space weapon, missile, and nuclear weapon programs are in high gear. Now, you know, military might is limited by a nation's economic might. The communism of the old Soviet Union was simply unable to keep pace with the robust strength of capitalism in the West. But China jettisoned Marxism and much of socialism and has adopted a form of capitalism. China's economy will surpass ours within the next 10 years. Measured by purchase power parity, it's already larger. And given China's population, its economy will eventually be much larger than ours. GDP, as you know, is the product of two things, the size of a nation's workforce and the output per worker. More Chinese workers will mean a much larger GDP. And China has made it clear it intends to be the economic, military, and geopolitical leader of the world. So yeah, today's autocracies led by China are becoming stronger. But at the same time, our resolve to follow the Constitution's path Avoiding the perils of authoritarianism on one hand and pure democracy on the other, that's wavering. Now, no more stunning evidence of that was the attempt to prevent the lawful and constitutional transfer of power on January 6th. It followed from the President of the United States claiming that the election had been stolen from him. His purported evidence spun from pillar to post, from counterfeit ballots imported from China to stuffed ballot boxes the dead voters, the voting machines manipulated from some far off place. Even more recently, a prominent TV pundit traveled to Hungary to extol Viktor Orban as a model for us to emulate. Orban censors the media in his country, ignores the will of the people in elections, amasses wealth for himself and his cronies. Hungary is ranked as one of the least free, least democratic countries in the developed world. Hungary, a model for America? As I was running for, for Senate, I held a number of uh, town meetings. Uh, in one, a woman asked me if I would vote to remove NBC, CBS, and ABC from the air. I said, no, of course. And I presumed that she had a point she was going to make about something I'd said. But no, her point was simply that they should not be allowed on TV. She said the networks like that said things that were wrong and they should be shut down. And I've since learned that her perspective is not as singular as I had imagined. Constitutional and institutional guardrails 
are under less obvious but just as real challenges in Washington. Politicians claim to try and get rid of the Electoral College. Many of my Democratic colleagues want to pack the Supreme Court, the logic apparently being that whoever has the majority in Congress should be able to conform the court to its own political philosophy. The court would therefore cease to be a separate and equal branch and instead become a subsidiary partisan branch. Now, the same sentiment applies to the effort to eliminate the filibuster. By, by the way, despite its name, it's not really a rule about senators giving interminable speeches. Uh, it, it's a rule that requires 60 votes for major legislation to pass through the Senate. Accordingly, compromise between two parties is required for a bill to pass, and this in turn gives the minority a voice and a certain measure of power, and therefore it slows things down. Madison actually explained that the Senate would serve as a necessary fence against the fickleness and passion that often influenced the public and the House of Representatives. Washington is said to have described the Senate as a saucer that cooled legislation passed out of the House, like a saucer catches hot tea that overflows from a cup. Since its early history, Senate rules have therefore allowed unlimited debate. The filibuster rule has been a cornerstone of the institution for nearly two centuries. Eliminating it would forever change one of the key institutions of our republic, one that checks the power of the majority and preserves the influence of the minority. Doing so would draw us closer and closer to the shoal of pure democracy. With the economic and military power of autocratic China and Russia increasing, and American resolve to avoid authoritarianism and pure democracy declining, freedom itself, the right of every person to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is in the balance. What is required of us who love freedom and the Constitution and America? First, our leaders in Washington must take action to prevent China from continuing to build its economic might through predatory means through practices that violate the rules of international trade and order. China must not be allowed to continue to steal intellectual property. It must not be allowed to massively subsidize industries that then bankrupt the Western companies that abide by international rules. It must not be allowed to monopolize key raw materials. Now, the United States alone isn't able to enforce those kinds of restrictions. Our economy is simply not large enough to discipline China's malevolent behavior. It's imperative, therefore, that we join forces with other nations, like us that abide by the rules of international order, to clearly establish accepted practices and deny access to our markets to China if it flaunts them. But there's also work to do here at home. Among many other things, we've got to modernize our military. We need to endeavor to make our businesses more successful and more competitive. We should invest a great deal more in emerging technologies. One commentator has truthfully said this. He said, every bill before Congress should be evaluated by whether or not it strengthens America versus China. Every bill. Now, one more thing for all of us here. Um, please excuse a personal reference uh, to my faith. But the founder of my religion is purported to have said that the, United, the Constitution of the United States would someday, quote, hang, as it were, by a thread. Further, that the elders of the church would save it. Now, they didn't have tape recorders back then <laughs> or smartphones, and I'm not sure at all that he actually said that. But if you will allow me some literary license, I'd suggest that this sentiment may apply to all of us, not just to a few Latter-day Saint elders. We can help, if you will, thread the needle between authoritarianism on one side and rampant pure democracy on the other by exercising what the founders called public virtues, listening respectfully to the opinions of others, expanding our sources of information beyond those we agree with, defending the entire Constitution rather than just the parts of it we like, voting for men and women of character and probity, and acknowledging that there's a great deal that we just don't know. The founders gave us a republic. As Benjamin Franklin said, 
It's up to us to keep it. I sure hope we will. Thank you so much.